Now, MediaTek's evolution over the last decade or so has been one of the more interesting ones. We can, in fact, divide MediaTek's history into four noticeable eras. First, we had the no-name Chinese phone era. This is when MediaTek processors were basically used in cheap Chinese knockoff phones like, you know, your Goo phones and whatnot. Then that was followed by what I'm going to call that processor in low-end Chinese phones era. This is where we started to see more mainstream brands, at least the Chinese ones like Xiaomi adopt MediaTek. This was the phase where brands like Blue in the West, Micromax, Carbon, etc. in India were rebranding OEM phones and most of these had MediaTek chips on the inside. Next up, we had the we are gonna blow up era, not literally blow up, but this is a phase where MediaTek tried to break through into the premium segment with their Helio X series. It did not really pan out. That's because MediaTek didn't have the reputation with the consumers. They lacked strong enough branding for manufacturers to go with their chips on flagship phones. The flagship Helio X series, it went away. And they kind of did, did away with the entire Helio branding actually. Now, finally, after this is what I'm going to call the resurgence era. One where MediaTek, instead of stretching themselves too thin and shooting for the moon, doubled down on improving what they already had, which was a strong presence in the entry level and mid segments. With their new Diamond City lineup, they managed to release very strong SOCs that have been widely adopted and have also been received positively. This has helped them build up consumer goodwill and inspired confidence in manufacturers to choose MediaTek even for their premium mid-range phones. For example, phones with the Diamond City 1200, they've been very positively received and sometimes they are even preferred over a Qualcomm alternate. Now with the Diamond City 9000, MediaTek's once again shooting for the stars, but this time the base is strong, they've built up a solid reputation and most importantly, the tech is cutting edge. By God, it's cutting edge. This is what we are going to be taking a close look in today's video. Hey guys, my name is Ash. Sorry for the super long intro. But if you are still here, I can promise you this one's going to be worth your time. Let's jump right in. Let's start with taking a look at what's on offer with the Diamond City 9000. Here are the raw specs. This is an 8 core processor. We have 4 little Cortex A510 cores clocked at 1.8 GHz. These are the power efficient cores. Then we have 3 Cortex, I mean the big cores, uh, A710 cores clocked at 2.85 GHz. Then, I mean, there is one Cortex X2 core clocked at 3.05 GHz. Now this is the prime core, the one that's going to be used uh, when single core performance is needed. To understand why this is a huge deal, don't look at the clock speeds, instead look at the cores themselves. These are all cores that are built on the ARM V9 ar architecture, which succeeds ARM V8 that came out all the way back in 2011. What this means to the end consumer is that almost every year, we hear we have this much gains in this, that much gains in that. But this time when you hear that, you're still going to get the pre I mean, pretty much the same spiel. But when you hear it, it's actually going to be a lot more significant. Now, for example, the Snapdragon 865, it has one higher clocked Cortex A77 as prime, three regular Cortex A77s as, you know, your regular big cores, and then three Cortex A55 based cores as your little cores, the ones for power efficiency. Now, from there, we went to having a dedicated prime core Cortex X1, three Cortex A78, and four Cortex A55 cores for the Snapdragon 888. Given it's all ARM V8, the performance gain officially, it wasn't all that great. It was supposed to be around 15% for CPU. Now, here the move from A78 to A710, A55 to A510, X1 to X2. With these, the gains are expected to be a whole lot more. X1 to X2, for example, there's a 35% increase in performance expected. And BDW, this is also the first TSMC 4 nanometer chip. So the transistors are gonna be more densely packed. And that means lesser heat and better power efficiency. 37% is the claim from MediaTek. Now, A78 to A710. MediaTek hasn't released any official claims here, but if we go by what ARM has to say, this is just a 10% gain. But on the same note, which basically means if you have a A78 that's built on five nanometers and compare it to a similarly clocked A710 that's also built on, a, on five nanometers, then you're going to see a 10% improvement in performance. Uh, at the same time, of course, 30% uh, more power efficiency. But this is if the A710 was on 5 nanometers. But here, MediaTek is using the 4 nanometer node. So expect the numbers to be a little bit better. Now, the biggest gains, that's going to be with the little cores. 
In the last four years, the big cores have been tinkered around with almost every year. We had the A75 followed by the 76, followed by the 77 and the 78 plus X1 combination. But the little cores, they've remained unchanged. It's It's been A55 throughout. You go back to 2017, what was the little cores? A55, 2019, A55, 2021 still A55. Now, given this is the first time in four whole years that ARMS redesigned the little cores, we have huge gains, 35% in performance while also being 20% more power efficient. Now, all this is just for the CPU. If you think that's, that's it, I mean, be prepared for more surprises. The GPU, MediaTek here has posted claims directly comparing it with the Qualcomm Snapdragon 888. The expectation with this 10 core Mali uh, G710 GPU is a 35% improvement in performance uh, alongside a 60% improvement in power efficiency compared to this year's Adreno. This GPU is also going to be bringing ray tracing on Vulkan support. Now that's not all, we have more firsts. The Diamond City 9000 is the first chip to provide support for Bluetooth 5.3. This is important since Bluetooth 5.3 is what brings LE audio. Uh, now, for a while we've had classic and LE or low energy Bluetooth coexisting on our phones. When we listen to music or say take a call, we use classic Bluetooth. This comes with better range, a higher data throughput, and also higher power consumption. Now, when we say pair a fitness tracker to our phone, that is not going to be using classic Bluetooth, but instead using a low energy radio, Bluetooth LE. The range on this isn't that high. Data throughput isn't that high again, but the power efficiency, it consumes a lot less power and that's what's most important for a fitness tracker. So the, the, power, the power consumption here is a fraction of what classic Bluetooth needs. With LE audio, we can now expect that, but with audio. And that's just the TLDR version. In fact, LE audio has uh, brings a lot, a lot to the table enough so that it's actually worth doing an entire video on. But if you're curious, I'll leave a link to what LE audio brings to the table in the description below. And if you guys wanna see a dedicated video on it, let me know in the comments below. Uh, so anyway, given how we are all depending on Bluetooth earphones more and more, cause brands seem intent on making Jack go the way of the dodo, uh, LE audio is huge and Bluetooth 5.3 is the first step in adoption for it. Now, apart from this, we have some other interesting improvements. Wi-Fi 6C support, a new ISP that can theoretically capture 4K HDR video from three cameras, which again is an industry first, and source support for up to 320 megapixels, as well as support for the new LPDDR5X RAM. Uh, talking about new, the new AI processing unit is supposed to be performing 4X better than the last one. More interestingly, uh, MediaTek claims this APU, the AI processing unit, beats Google's Tensor chip by 16%. Given all these firsts, it seems like for the first time, MediaTek seems to have a genuine flagship chip capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with what, what Qualcomm has to offer. With the recent failures of Exynos and the situation that HiSilicon's found itself in, there's most, most definitely a void when it comes to offering Qualcomm competition in the flagship category. Here's to hoping the Diamond City 9000 does just that. We'll know for sure once phones with Diamond City 9000 start shipping, which is expected to happen in the first uh, in, in the first quarter of 2022. So I found this development very interesting and I personally feel Diamond City 9000 is the next big thing. So I thought it's worth doing a video on. Now, if you have any questions or feedback on how you feel I could have uh, gone, gone about better with this video leave a comment down below and while you're down there thumbs up thumbs down based on whatever you felt about the video subscribe turn on notifications hit that bell icon if you haven't yet and thanks a lot for watching till next time my name's ash you've been watching c4 retech and i'm signing off for now you guys have a great day bye bye